everyone. I'm Riyadh Akyol and this is Dignified Resilience, a podcast on fresh narratives on confronting despair, alleviating distress, and forging ahead. In this podcast, we hear from people around the globe at all stages of life and variety of industries and learn how to channel dignified resilience to survive, feed the soul to heal, and connect with others through inspiring compassionate actions and behavior. At the same time, I aim to grow a global conversation that seeks to better acknowledge different socio-cultural perspectives on meaningfully weathering life's adversities and achieving well-being. Here is a noble and humane invitation for surpassing our old selves by learning about and from other people's moving forces and limitations for successfully overcoming affliction and ache. Remember, we have different lives, distinct pathways, cultures, and contexts but we can find common ground in supporting dignified resilience anywhere. So let's go then. Hello everyone and welcome to Dignified Resilience. Um, It's really an honor and I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Javon Babel in today's episode. He's an associate professor of psychology and neuroscience at New York University an affiliate at the Stern School of Business and Management Organization and Director of Social Identity and Morality Lab. From neurons to social networks, Jay's research examines how collective concerns like group identities, moral values, and political beliefs shape the mind, brain, and behavior. And those are the topics that I really love to learn about in my free time that I don't have, so I learn about it all the time. And uh, Jay's research team actually studies these issues using a social neuroscience approach that incorporates neuroimaging of reason, patients, um, if I pronounce it correctly, social cognitive tasks, cross-cultural surveys, and linguistic analysis of social media posts. Jay has published over 100 academic um, publications and written research essays for some of the world's most um, prominent media, uh, but the reason why and the basis of our conversation today is his new book, The Power of Us, Harnessing Our Shared Identities to Improve Performance, Increase Cooperation, and Promote Social Harmony, um, and uh, which he authored, of course, with Dominic J. Packer. I just want to say one more thing before I welcome Jay here. Um, I was really excited to talk about this, not because I find these themes truly fascinating, but also because I think they're incredibly important to understand. Um, I have followed Jay's work for months now, whether it's on disinformation, whether it's through the lab that he's um, in charge of. So it's a great pleasure to host him today and share this conversation so we can all learn and hopefully um, learn how to you know, create more social societal harmony. Before we get to all this, I wanna say hi, hello Jay, and welcome to Dignified Resilience. How are you today? I'm great, thanks for having me on. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here. Um, congrats on the publication of the book again. So let's start from the beginning to guide and help our listeners and viewers get the big picture. About this dynamics of shared identities, what causes people to develop a social identity? What happens to people when they define themselves in terms of these group memberships? So the basic question is, uh, this is part of our DNA as humans, that we evolved in small groups, and uh, every culture that's ever been studied on Earth forms coalitions, and these are flexible. They change depending on the situation you're in. And so uh, for many of us, you can create these, and I create them in the lab or the classroom simply by flipping a coin and putting people on two teams. Um, but in the real world, for most of us, this means like when I walk in the door after coming home at the end of a workday, I see my kids and my uh, identity shift from professor to father mm-hmm. you know, in a few seconds, and all mm-hmm. of a sudden, my kids don't care uh, you know, what I did at work that day. They want to know like what's for dinner that night. And so we all have... Um, you know, many identities, the, the quote we use in our book is that we contain multitudes. Mm-hmm. And the situation determines what identities are at the front of our mind at any given moment. And once those get triggered, it changes how we think about and see the world and how we act. Mm-hmm. And what exactly, let's clarify, what do we mean by groups? Like how do groups become part of this identity? Yeah, so basically we have, you know, people think of themselves as having individual identities. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, in our minds, we're often like the protagonist in a story and going through these chapters of our life. Um, But the way it actually works out for most people is that even in a given day, you have multiple identities. uh, Mm -hmm. And, you know, because of this, 
you know, there's not really a unified sense of self the way that we think of it. In fact, we contain so many different selves um, and the way that we should probably think about, you know, who we are is fundamentally about the groups that we belong to um, because the groups that we belong to determine, you know, who, what our self is at a given moment. So for example, I went home uh, for vacation to Canada uh, where, from where I live in New York and, you know, my old identity got triggered. You know, I started thinking about myself in a different way, started like slipping into old habits uh, in terms of my behaviors and what I ate. And so this is one of those things is that the group of the, you know, environment that I grew up in, in Canada is embedded in who I am. But most of my days when I'm, you know, sitting here in New York City, I'm not thinking about that at all. It's not really until I go home or maybe during the Olympics, I turn on the TV and something triggers me to think about that again. But it's it's still deeply embedded within who I am. And it just is kind of lying dormant until it gets triggered. And to me, it it that makes complete sense. And I mean, that yeah, identities are not a stable or static thing. I think I read in your book that you, you write that it is counterintuitive to most people that identity is dynamic and multifaceted. And I would just like to add and want to ask you, does that make sense to you? Or uh, is it that to me, it is quite the opposite, that to me, the fact that we contain multitudes is something that I have always wanted to emphasize, precisely because um, I have been always kind of put in the boxes that are very essentializing and that are very simplified. So that to me, saying we contain multitudes is basically kind of like saying, hello, good afternoon. Does that make sense that the way that I was kind of experiencing that idea shaped that perception of this? Yeah. And I think if you're a person uh, who's traveled the world and gone and lived in different places, this is like second nature to you. Um, but I'll, I'll just give for an example of myself. I grew up in a very small town, isolated from the rest of humanity in Northern Alberta. And it wasn't until I left that when I graduated uh, mm -hmm. high school and went to a city that I realized, oh, what it means to be a rural person and from a small town is radically different. And then when I moved to the United States, it changed again. And then when I moved to New York City, it changed again. And so it's by leaving the environments that we're used to that we have a sense of who we are and we start to understand the assumptions behind, you know, the ways of being. But, but you know, that comes from, from you know, leaving your, your comfort zone. You start to mm -hmm. see who you were in a way that you might not have appreciated. It's kind of the way we think of it is it's kind of like gravity. You know, gravity has been acting on humans for the entire human history. But it wasn't until Isaac Newton, like, you know, saw an apple drop, apparently, that he realized gravity was acting on us all the time. And you can think about this in terms of our groups. Our groups are like the gravitational force that's pulling us in all kinds of different directions. Um, and, and it's guiding our behavior in ways we're not aware of. And so that's kind of, uh, you know, one way of, of thinking about the way that social groups play out and the way that identity operates. Mm -hmm. And surely, as you write, we're driven by those identities to interpret the world in a certain way. Like you write, we're perceived through identity colored glasses. But then we also come, even though we can shift and those identities can shift how we think about the world, uh, we also come to norms and conformity uh, to norms. Can you tell us a little bit about it and what does conformity to norm actually accomplish for a group? Yeah, so one of the ways that you know, I think Americans especially uh, have been reading a lot about tribalism, you know, in the media the last four or five or six years. So people have a sense that identity matters and, and polarization shapes our politics. Um, what they often don't think about is that second part of groups, which is once you identify with a group, how you behave is determined by the norms of the group. And those norms can get you to do all kinds of interesting things. In, in fact, things that have nothing to do with tribalism. And so I'll, I'll give you a couple examples. Um, one example, when we people have a notion of tribalism, um, they think that the moment you're part of a group, it want, makes you want to discriminate against other groups. And there's no question that, that that does happen a lot, but that's not necessarily the case. So if you belong to a group and identify with a group that's really inclusive and embraces difference, you will actually, the more you identify the group, the more you'll embrace outsiders. And so there's lots of, you know, for every, every example you can think of a group that discriminates, I can probably come up with an example of a group that it embraces difference. So you can think of like the Red Cross or Doctors Without Borders. Um, these are groups that the more committed to the group you become, the more willing you're, you are to reach out to people who are different from you and help them. Um, the other part of tribalism that, that is kind of shattered by this notion of, of norms is the notion of individualism. 
So again, when people, and this is especially an American idea that we are all like unique snowflakes, individuals, you know, rugged individualists who don't wanna go along with the crowd or be sheeple. Um, it turns out there's great research on this showing that the more you identify as an American, the more you embrace the idea of being an individualist, which other, in other words, it means that individualism is itself a form of conformity to the norms of being an American or, or other groups that value individualism. So this is one of these things that the norms, it's not just identity that matters, the norms of the group you identify with are what determines your behavior and beliefs in ways that often like are myth shattering or the opposite that we'd normally expect people to behave when they get in groups. And the particular norms that guide people um, at any given moment can vary, right? And that changes. And I definitely want to talk about it as we go along and what does it depend on and, you know, which parts are, of themselves are activated and active and salient in that moment. But especially as we will come back to norms and what you say are very sensible psychological motives that drive people to conform to group norms, which is fascinating and super scary to me. Before that, can you please explain to our audience what are, as you call, the principles of identity? Um, the principle, I can't remember what I wrote about the principles of well, identity. Yeah, I mean, and you mentioned it a little bit. First, that the groups people belong to are often fundamental to their sense of understanding, which you, you know, said, of course, at the beginning, and that they have this, which you, I will ask you later to elaborate when we go down, how they have this readiness to collaborate and establish kind of find collective solidarity, which is what I thought was great, and that when a particular social identity is active, that it has um, effects on behavior. So I think you said it, but I just, as the way that I, as a reader, got it was uh, formed under that principles of identity explanation. But then, while a great number of good things can come out as we share these social identities with others, there is totally one, I mean, not one, but there is a dark side to this, because there is always an outgroup to our in-groups. Can you tell us a little bit about what then could help us resist that? You talk about institutions, et cetera. Yeah, so I, I, I'll just say this. One of the reasons we created the title, The Power of Us, is because we want to talk about the power of group identity for good things, you know, solidarity, collaboration, social change, uh, social support. Um, but we want, also wanted to talk about the dark side of identity, um, which sometimes can mean conformity to, to dangerous norms, to discrimination, to violence and even genocide. And so we have an entire chapter, for example, on discrimination. Mm -hmm. And one of the things about discrimination that makes it incredibly difficult to overcome is that a lot of the environments that we're in uh, reinforce discrimination. They trigger old identities, uh, oppressive uh, social structures can trigger those identities and make people want to mistreat other groups, especially minority groups. Um, and so one of the things we discuss is not only the need to create shared identities, you know, that include many different groups. And so those are ways that we can get past discrimination, at least in the short term. But in the long term, what we need to really do is build institutions, um, institutions that bring different people together, that find ways to support other people who are suffering, um, that help counteract, you know, uh, you know, structures that are oppressive. Mm -hmm. And so when we, we, you know, we have an entire chapter on leadership because we think leadership is basically the fundamental way that a lot of uh, bad norms are created. And uh, also the opportunity for solidarity and social change is often triggered by effective leadership and rhetoric and changing the narrative in ways that allow people to see something that's different from what they've been uh, living in. Mm. And again, absolutely, I, I, I wanna get back to leadership but I also want to get back to something that you mentioned in terms of uh, discrimination in minorities. I think that one of the things that I did not know and that I learned from your book, which again was, uh, th that's the part in this sort of books that usually gets me very depressed when I refer, uh, I'm referring to those toxic patterns of standard group and identity dynamics, because you write that regardless of where people live, the sense of threat made the outgroup loom closer in their minds, which I thought was incredibly we need to learn this stuff, I thought, because yeah. it's so prevalent in the media in terms of the discourse of the leaders and not just last United States President Trump. I mean, and, and, and the pattern, as you write, that was driven by feelings of what psychologists call symbolic or cultural threats rather than realistic threats, 
Viktor Orban comes to my mind in terms of just latest statement last week when he was in a full room of European leaders said, we don't want Muslims. This is our cultural identity, literally. And um, that was very scary. And that rang the bell when I read about this um, idea of kind of cultural threats rather than realistic threats. That is the part that kind of first made me think it is leadership, but it's also the language and constantly this in-group, out-group play, right? Yeah, so you touched on some really important things there. The first is that when you're threatened by groups, one thing that we found in many different studies, you know, whether we're looking at people's perceptions of immigrants, mm -hmm. legal immigrants coming over the border, uh, or whether we're talking about baseball fans, where they see the art tribal baseball stadium, um, if they're really threatened by the other group, then they're more likely to perceive them as being closer than they actually are. So they, th they, you know, you give them a map and ask them where the other, you know, stadium is from their arch rival, mm -hmm. you know, uh, baseball team, and they start to draw it as closer than it actually is. Mm -hmm. Or if you ask, you know, Americans how close the border is, you know, or Mexico City is, mm -hmm. um, if they're worried about threatened by um, Mexican illegal immigration, they see it as closer to them than it actually is. Um, so this is something um, that we found also, as you said, is really driven by a specific type of threat. When we talk about things like immigration, the thing that often gets talked about politically, you know, in, in mainstream newspapers is like, well, you know, immigrants coming over can benefit the economy, you know, they can provide, you know, numerous benefits. And there's lots of examples of innovators who are former immigrants and Nobel Prize winners. Um, but the real trigger for, for many people who are opposed to immigration are cultural and symbolic. Mm -hmm. um, they're really worried about threats from groups that are different religions than them, uh, different languages, uh, different traditions. And you have authoritarian leaders, you mentioned Viktor Orban, but mm -hmm. there, there are many others, and this goes back throughout the entirety of human history, that prey on this fear. In fact, not only do they uh, wind people up and, and create fear and and uh, angst around these types of threats, um, but they often do it to generate power for themselves because if they can distract from their own failings or mobilize people around a threat that might not even be there, um, might not even be a real threat, then they're able to, you know, cultivate a group of people who will support them, uh, you know, even if they are deeply corrupt themselves. Um, and so this is a, unfortunately, a tool that's been used for mm -hmm. many, many years. And we do, though, have biases that we might think we don't have as well, right? Yeah, so the other thing about that we try to draw out in our book is that a lot of our biases are we're not aware of or we're not in control mm -hmm. of. And so this is really one of the things that's come out of psychology in the last 20 years. A lot of the associations we have with certain groups are like a reflex arc. You know, I think of them like when you go to the doctor and they tap your knee and your leg just kicks out. This is the way that people are triggered by certain stereotypes that they hold. Even people who want to be egalitarian, um, if these types of associations, beliefs, and prejudices are ingrained in them, they get triggered very easily. And so that's something we need to understand is that even you know good people have uh, some of these hidden biases. And this these can be triggered, again, by leaders and rhetoric and the media. And so we have to be mindful mm -hmm. that part of what they're doing sometimes is preying on our associations or our unconscious. Mm -hmm. Which is what then leads me back a little bit to conformity. And I think um, that I, our listeners would really benefit. Can you talk a little bit about not just social, social psychologist Solomon Ash uh, in terms of his groundbreaking experiments on conformity? Um, and I do want to ask you, while I was reading that, Alberto Bandura come to my mind as well, which was not mentioned in the book. And that's where the humanization comes in. And I want to ask you about the humanization because I think that is hugely important. But um, step by step, tell me about this conformity. Why, what happens in these experiments and how is it, what does it tell us about these group identities as well? Yeah, so these are very, maybe the most famous experiments on conformity by uh, Solomon Ash. I believe he ran these when he was a professor at Princeton. And he would bring in a bunch of uh, participants to a study and all they had to do is look in front of them at three lines and then th there was a line to the right and you had to you had to guess which one it matched up with how long it was and so it's a simple task you just look at these lines you say you know is this line that you're seeing as long as line a line b or line c and anybody can do this if i gave them to you right now you'd score 100 percent on this um but he had a little trick up his sleeve so when he brought in seven people the seventh person who came into the room who had to judge the lines was the only real participant 
the other six people who came in before them looked like participants, but they were actually Confederates working with the experimenter. And they would give the wrong uh, judgment. And so even if it was a short line and the answer was C, they would say, all of them would say it's answer A. And so the participant would have their turn to say if they thought it was, you know, which line was. And they, when they saw all six people before them say the wrong thing, they would often say the wrong thing. So in other words, they would say something that they knew to be false just to fit in and conform with the rest of the group. Um, and so it was a really powerful demonstration that, you know, on many trials for many people, you can get them to conform to something completely absurd. You can get them to disagree with what their own eyes are saying. So in, in some sense, it, you know, preceded, uh, you know, 1984, but it's very Orwellian in this notion that you can convince people to express something they know that's not true. Um, then he had, and I think this is what's forgotten about, he had a condition in a, in a follow-up study where he had, you know, these six people came in and predict, said how long they thought the line was. But as long as just one of those people mm -hmm. dissented, then it freed the participant up to be honest. And so this is something about the dynamics in groups that's really important is that if you are in a group and everybody is saying something that's wrong, even if you feel compelled to go along, it's really important that you dissent because other people who don't agree with it might be comfortable dissenting as well. And so it, it triggers a, a shift in the culture and the context that allows people to dissent in a way that, you know, breaks with, the, in, in this context, really toxic group norms about uh, fiction. You know, we, we're living in a world where there's, a, you know, a, a huge amount of uh, fake news around almost every issue. The big one that's concerning to me right now is around vaccination. And this is like circulating online and, you know, a, you know, people in your community or in your social media might be sharing something that you know to be untrue. If that's the case, it is important that you dissent so other people can see that not everybody's going along with this, especially if you're in a culture where people are, are spreading this type of information. Dissent is cool. We'll talk about how, why, again, why dissent is so important and why from my professional experience, let alone personal, I think that as you write, um, stifling consent is ultimately so unproductive for the group where uh, from which one is trying to dissent when constructive. Uh, and, and so I just want to reiterate uh, what you said. So why do we go along with others? Okay, so it's peer pressure when we want to fit in, when we think that they are good source of information and then a third reason which i have again experienced for uh, from my work and life is to express valued identities and that can be very productive but it can also be very toxic as well precisely because in some groups there is not much support for critical thinking even uh, let alone anything else that supposedly goes against the norms of what that identity should be uh, or should look like. And I really appreciated how I learned and how you write contagion is not the right word for conformity because it stops at the group edge, right? And, and that really makes sense to me um, in a way. So even though there are these experiments about conformity, of course, right? And we know about Milgram as well. You and Dominic studied and found something very important and it was about 150 volts, uh, which I think was also really, uh, I didn't know about it and it did make sense to me. And I will tell you that while I was reading all of the research that you write about, I couldn't help but obviously think about Bosnian genocide because there is a lot of still, how did these people who lived together, how did neighbors ultimately kill each other? And yes, of course, it's everything. There are 10 stages of genocide in Bosnia. Because of Bosnia, there is 11th stage now, glorification of genocide. But not just the conformity uh, and the importance of leaders that I keep learning from and the language, etc. I was very interested to learn about this turning point of 150 volts and why that's important there there is a turning point right where a person can move back and decide whether to go forward or not yeah so what you're talking about is probably the most famous set of studies in the history of social psychology um, which is when Stan, stanley milgram brought people into the lab and he brought them in and they were supposed to play the role of a teacher they're supposed to teach someone else a simple memorization task i think it was and a person in the other room, every time they got a question wrong, you were supposed to shock them if you were the participant. And so every time they got it wrong, the shock went up. It started at 15 volts. They got another question wrong, you rose it to 30 volts, then up to 45 volts. And then by the end, you if you went all the way through the study, you were shocking them 450 volts. And, and you know by then they had said they had a heart problem, 
and they went completely silent. And about two thirds of people, in, at least in the original study, shocked all the way up to 450 volts. And if you ask people if they would do this, and I do this in my class, I teach intro psych to over 300 people. I always describe the study first and ask them, would you shock to 450 volts? And not a single hand goes up in the whole room out of 300 people, maybe one or two people put their hand up. Um, and, and they asked before Milgram asked, ran these studies, he asked professional uh, you know, mental health practitioners, how many people are gonna do this all the way? And almost none of them thought that, that you know, people were gonna shock all the way to 450 volts. But in reality, about two thirds do. And so why do people do this? And so there's a couple key lessons from this. Um, that, that one that Dominic, actually, my co-author, discovered by going back and reanalyzing all of Stanley Milgram's data was that as you're shocking them up this 150, you know, at 15 volt increments all the way up to 450 volts, up to the level where you think it might be a lethal shock, you think you might have killed a random stranger in the room, you know, four feet away from you. Um, people are willing to do this all the way up, but there's one point in the study where they actually are, if, if they're going to descent, they're likely to do it at 150 volts. And so why 150 volts? Well, at 150 volts, you know, throughout most of the study, the person is like screaming in pain every time you shock them more. But at 150 volts, they basically invoke their rights. They basically tell you just to stop doing it. You have no right to shock them. And that seems to trigger in people a choice point psychologically. Mm -hmm. They have to decide at that point, do they go along with the, the person pressuring you to continue shocking them, which is the, you know, the research team? Or do you side with the person in another room who you're shocking and realize you have no right to do this? It's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and if you go along at 150 volts, you end up going all the way up to 450 mm -hmm. volts. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a pretty radical difference in the way we used to think about this obedience experiment, which was really about empathy. If the person screams, then you might stop. If they scream louder, you're more likely to stop. Well, really, it's something about understanding what your role is, who you are as an individual, are you the type of person who goes along with this? Mm -hmm. and, and what some research has found that we, we talk about in our book is that one of the reasons people go along if they do go along is because they identify with science. So we often think of identifying with science and, and research as a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a case where your identification with science and the scientist in the room who's encouraging you to shock this person mm -hmm. can lead you to bad things. And so it turns out that there's a really important lesson here, which is a lot of times people do evil things they do it because they are identifying with what they think is a good cause. And if yeah. they think that the cause is virtuous, then the ends justify the means for them in their mind. And they're often even willing to do things that they don't think are right. And so that's uh, fundamentally one of the dangers of identity is, is getting kind of in an identity that you think is virtuous where you're willing to harm people. And, and that's why it's important to have a set of values that are outside of that, that you can uh, reference and understand that, you know, even though I might support science, I'm not going to do it to the point of potentially killing somebody because I, I know that that violates kind of my higher order set of values. And again, I mean, that totally made sense within the scope and explanation of um, genocidal history uh, in a country where I'm from. But I do, again, want to emphasize Alberto Bandura's experiment, and he did it a year after, I think, Milgram. And it it really showed and he was surprised to learn that dehumanization of workers had much stronger effect than dispersal of responsibility, which is what he thought. So I think that dehumanization, which again is kind of that idea of us versus you and that virtuous mission, that moral mission of higher ground, uh, which really can lead and has led so many times to huge atrocities throughout the history. But then I do want to ask you and you use um, I mean, you use cults, you use the seekers, you use different examples. Why would the group clinch to the belief system even after watching it get debunked? Tell us about this idea of cognitive dissonance. And um, actually, one of the research that you did that I used in my previous um, speaker's engagement was precisely on this disinformation and why facts don't work and why somebody can even double down on something even though they might know and there are different incentives in a particular circumstances why these people and groups of people continue to reject the facts so to speak but if for example there are there are so many international courts and you know trials uh, there are so many facts verdicts about something let's say as an example of course uh, genocide and you have so much denial about it why does this group uh, clinch to this belief even after watching it get debunked yeah so this is one of my favorite studies of, of all time it was 
uh, spurred by uh, Leon Fessinger, who is basically the person who came up with a cognitive dissonance theory, which is when you have two conflicting beliefs, it, it's really uncomfortable for people. And so they have to choose one and they want to choose one really quickly just to get rid of the feeling of dissonance. Mm -hmm. And so he thought it'd be maybe the most powerful way to test this would be among cult members, especially cult members who, you know, thought that the world was going to end. And so when he was reading the newspaper one day, he saw this advertisement for this or this uh, story about this cult leader um, who was predicting this, you know, basically the kind of an end of days type of prophecy. And he went and infiltrated the cult and wrote a book on it. With his, with his research team, his graduate students and colleagues. And they pretended to be cult members. Mm -hmm. And what happened was that the cult leader predicted that, you know, at midnight on this very specific day, you know, this alien ship's gonna come down and save all the true believers and then there's gonna be this catastrophic flood. And so they're all in the room on, and you know, the clock strikes midnight. And he knew of course, um, or at least he's cynical enough to think that this, this prophecy was wrong and it was mm -hmm. completely, you know, insane. And so he watched what happened to people in the room when this, when this moment unfolded where they they had to choose they had a, a more enormous amount of cognitive dissonance between they had this belief system as cult members. Mm -hmm. And it was just completely proven wrong because the prophecy, the main prophecy was based on failed. Mm -hmm. And so there was a really interesting kind of countdown of what happened minute by minute. And after a few minutes, someone said, well, maybe the clock's wrong. And they ran into another room and found another clock that was like, running, you know, a few minutes later, and they thought, okay, we'll wait for this clock to strike midnight, and then the mm -hmm. alien ship will come get us. And that clock went to midnight, and they're all now sitting in the room with no excuse, uh, and this enormous dissonance, someone was crying in the room, and they had a choice point at that moment to decide, am I going to stick with this belief system, even though it's proven wrong, or am I going to update my beliefs and leave this group behind and go back to my normal life? Mm -hmm. And the problem was that uh, for these people, this was a huge part of their identity. They'd often mm -hmm. like left their family behind, given their belongings. Mm -hmm. And what he found is that, the, you know, the cult leader came up with some excuse after several hours into the morning that they were all saved because of their true beliefs. And so they had saved the world by virtue of their beliefs. Mm -hmm. And so this gave them an excuse to get rid of the cognitive dissonance and decide that, you know, even though the prophecy had failed, it was because of their belief. And then they basically doubled down on their belief. So instead of thinking, you know, holding the belief a little less lightly, or maybe thinking of you know, spending less time with the cult, they started proselytizing and spreading the word about the cult even more broadly than they had before. And so what this was, was a moment where there was basically two key predictors of whether or not you clung to this belief. Um, the first was the most committed group members were the most likely to cling to the belief um, because they were the most, you know, had the most cognitive dissonance, you know, in theory. And then the other thing he found is that if you're part of a group that reinforces the belief, then it's really hard to abandon. And so it's those two things, deep commitment plus social reinforcement that lead to this. And so if you look, you know, in the world of misinformation and you go online and you see this, um, that's part of what's sustaining people to hold on to these beliefs after they're fact-checked repeatedly, um, whether they're about genocide or vaccines or any number of different issues. It's that the most committed members cling to it and they have the most reason to reduce the cognitive dissonance they're feeling. Um, and they have this social support network. And I, I would say this is one thing that social media can do. It's easy to find someone who's going to support you uh, more than it ever was before when you had a, a belief falsified, unless you were actually literally in a cult. So that's kind of the cult psychology that is embedded within lots of people uh, at various times. And so it's very hard to kick that for individuals. Mm -hmm. And that group think absolutely that dynamic so often drives people to kind of seek shared realities, even when there's so much contradictory info. One thing that I do want to again emphasize is that this pressure kind of to maintain this cohesion um, and what is so scary is there are people who may privately have doubts about something, but that both this social support and the group think that occurs makes it not easy. Doesn't make it impossible, right? But just makes it so much harder to focus on facts or to kind of reason with facts, right? It barely works. Uh, and you did mention also QAnon and et cetera. And there are techniques that can orient people towards fact uh, rather than fiction, right? And let's just, when people want to pay attention they can. Yeah. So, so fact checks, which is what we've historically used to kind of like keep people in a reality based universe, um, do work. 
but they are much weaker when the issue is related to identity or politics. Mm -hmm. And that's when identity goals like fitting in and being part of a group and making sure your group is successful um, are things that can undercut the, the effectiveness of fact checking in that situation. And so what you need to do um, is either get somebody out of one of those groups. So if you're dealing with a family member who's in a cult or in some kind of deep in some conspiracy theory, um, you, you're probably giving them fact checks over like, uh, you know, coffee with them next time you see them is, might not be super helpful. And so you probably have to extract them from the cult that they're in or the conspiracy group that they're in. Um, the other thing you have to understand is that these groups often don't have norms that reinforce reality and, and, and facts. You know, I'm in the scientific community and we have norms and institutions that guide us towards facts. Even if I want something to be true, someone else can analyze my data and show that it's not true. Or someone can write a rebuttal in a journal and, and prove me wrong or stand up and disagree with me at a conference talk. And if I start sharing a bunch of misinformation or, or uh, fake news on my social media and my colleagues see it, I'm gonna stop getting invited to talks and events. Like my social status will plummet. Now compare that with like, if you're part of QAnon, sharing misinformation and conspiracy theories is what gains you status in those groups. Or if you're a flat earther, they have like their own conferences where they get up and whoever's got the most outlandish explanation for like, you know, to prove that the earth is flat, get the most status. People come up and shake your hand afterwards, invite you on podcasts. Um, you get to go to the bar afterwards and celebrate and you become like celebrated in that world. And so they're celebrating misinformation and they don't really have institutions that correct them and, and fact check them. And so I think a big part of the addressing this is having institutional ways of ensuring reality you know in, in investigative journalism there's like you have to report your sources and information you have editorial oversight if you're another fact-based uh, institution is uh, the legal system there are legal standards for evidence and there is a judge who ultimately has to weigh in on it so even if you want to go to court and argue something about the election being stolen you have to present proof and if you don't the judge will laugh you out of court and you'll have wasted time and you might even have to pay money for the legal fees of the people that uh, you, you sued. And so these are institutions that we've created over hundreds of years to kind of ensure society focuses on reality and it has kind of a sense of shared reality. Um, but I, I think I'm one of those people who thinks that hyperpartisan news and, and the growth of misinformation and, and social media are powerful institutions that kind of can push people in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I mean, I don't think we're still aware of the effects of social media and how our behavior keeps changing um, accordingly. And uh, though you correctly emphasized and made me think that even without social media, there are absolutely ways that still that can lead people to these bubbles and echo chambers. It's just that, of course, uh, social media just multiplies it and amplifies it to reiterate to listeners something that's based on the research and that you have said, and that I believe was it Chris Bale who you mentioned, well, they said that just receiving tweets from sources across political aisle, not only does it not help, but it actually backfires that people can double down on their beliefs. Which yeah, so Chris Bale has this, this really great study. We often have the assumption that if we just talk to people who are different than mm -hmm. us, We'll have a more open mind about things. And if you could just get people talking, then that would be useful. Mm -hmm. And so he basically tried to expose people to someone who's politically different than them. So mm -hmm. he had Democrats follow like these hyper partisan Twitter accounts of Republican figures. And he had Republicans follow hyper partisan Democratic figures. And he paid them money and they did it for several weeks. And then he measured their, you know, their basically political preferences. And what happened was, if anything, people became more polarized. And so simply listening to a partisan from across the aisle doesn't necessarily help you find a middle ground. In fact, it might be deeply irritating and annoying and, and a huge turnoff. Um, I think it probably helps you if you talk to somebody who like shares some common ground with you, but might be different on some issues. Um, but if you're just like trying to listen to the most extreme voices on the other side, uh, that at least in this study, which was a very rigorous, large study, uh, Found, was found to backfire, especially for Republicans. Them listening to a hyper-partisan Democrat really, uh, you know, entrenched them in their views even more. And this is why I think these conversations and books like yours and research that is done is, on this is so important because 
otherwise we just keep wasting our resources and wasting our energy and wasting our efforts and the polarization becomes um, higher and we just keep misunderstanding each other but that also uh, brings me back to this idea of dissent and how social identities motivate people to express dissent and i can to we can gather after all this information how really difficult um, it is based on your research uh, is it suggests that the deepest form of group loyalty actually often involves the expression of disagreement i thought that was so brilliant and i read your book and i was like aha you know this this makes sense and it's not very counter uh, it's not very kind of uh, easy for everybody to understand precisely because you also write and explain why people are uncomfortable with so-called moral rebels can you tell us a little bit about it and, and again, the importance of dissent and why are people uncomfortable with moral rebels? Yeah, so moral rebels is uh, a coined term by a moral psychologist, Benoit Monin. Uh, he's at Stanford Business School and his colleagues. And they found that people, you know, say in the abstract that they're willing to support someone who stands up for something. Um, but if they didn't stand up themselves and then they see that person stand up for something, they really don't like that person, in part because the person makes them look bad. Um, it is, is threatening. And so even if that person does the right thing, it can be uh, threatening to them psychologically. Um, and then add to that that the way that we've treated dissenters throughout history, even the terms we have for them is like rabble rouser or heretic. Uh, history is not kind to dissenters. And it's hard to be a dissenter if you're in a group and everybody wants to go along with something seemingly and you stand up and say, wait a second, I don't think this is a great idea. Um, you're often treated bad and you're worried about being ostracized or kicked out of the group, which is probably the thing that humans are evolutionarily designed to avoid more than anything else is being socially excluded by a group we care about. Mm -hmm. And so it's really, it's really hard to do. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and a lot of people have also the belief, it's kind of like, I'll paraphrase George Bush after 9-11, you're either with us or against us. We have this notion that you're either with the group or against us, um, that you're part of the, the out group. So it's really hard to be a dissenter within the group and challenge them without being seen as an outgroup mm -hmm. member. Um, but this is actually Dominic's research. He's run many studies and what he finds is over and over again, the people who are willing to stand up and dissent when they think a group is going wrong are the people who care most about it. And in part because you have to care a lot to stand up and dissent, right? Because mm -hmm. of all those risks we just talked about. Mm -hmm. And so he finds that it's in some ways the a most loyal thing you can do is if you see a group going wrong, the norms are going wrong, the group might self-destruct or do something really uh, sinister, that you need to say something. And you, and you say it, oops, because you care about the group. And so this is fundamentally why it's really important to um, find ways to create norms that support dissent, because yeah. if you don't do that, then you're starting to move into these other things we're gonna talk about, cult psychology, mm -hmm. groupthink. And so it's really important to do that. And then another thing we note in our book that's really important is, even if the dissenter is wrong, they help make it okay for other people to say something. And so even if you're not 100% right in your dissent, it's still important to say it because other people might have different reservations or concerns that they suddenly now feel safe to speak up about. And that's another reason why dissent is so crucial. Even getting the dissent right is not the important thing. It's the act of dissent. But I would say, and yeah. you have to be mindful, there's kind of a delicate down dance of the dissenter where you want to signal very clearly that you care about the group. Um, yeah. at the same time pointing out your constructive criticism of the group. Yeah, it really resonated when when you say um, how important is it not just about improving innovation and creativity and kind of avoiding this group decision making, but that really, if you don't allow it, well, then we have to think about why makes what makes this identity so insecure that we uh, don't allow this sort of conversations and that is why i think also freedom is very important to do it i think that space and you do write in your book about psychological safety but i also was thinking literally about physical safety for so many activists in the Middle East, for so many people around the world. I mean, from, you know, Ukraine, Belarus, et cetera, we've seen what's going on and what happens uh, with, with rulers uh, or tyrants on the spectrum uh, who really don't appreciate any sort of dissent. And of course, there are different conversations 
talking about religion is different than talking about management in Google, of course, but there is this idea that I think makes sense regardless, and that is about uh, allowing different opinions and having conversations that really, as you say, open minds. So um, I did want to emphasize the, the idea of freedom, which I think is so important, not just psychological, which you mentioned, but physical as well for dissent. And I do want to um, re-emphasize my support for um, that um, curiosity rather than defensiveness. But we do have to, as you say, understand that kind of the prerequisite for it is strong and secure identities. And why it, is it otherwise if, if it is not? It was so important and it was so fascinating for me to read some research as well how people behave when they take on identities influenced by group norms group norms and leadership and the importance of leaders really is about establishing and enforcing those norms right yeah so one of the things that leaders do is they create the environment you're in and that, by the way i love the term you you used about insecure identities is that mm -hmm. I think that's like, I, I'm going to try to remember that because <laughs> if your identity is insecure, then you're super threatened by any form of dissent or any lack of conformity with the group. Um, of course, one of the things leaders do is create norms and, and great leadership creates norms of inclusivity, of comfort with dissent and disagreement. And if they don't do that, obviously it's in part a form of insecure identity leadership, I think. But what you want as a leader is not only to create those norms, but then to defend them and protect them against incursion. So it's really important that the identity, that the, the leadership not only signals what the key uh, forms of norms are that they value, um, but then enforces them to ensure that other people in the group don't suppress dissent or engage in violence against people who disagree with them. And uh, what you see, I guess, maybe you're a perfect example of an insecure leader is probably like an authoritarian style leader, like the ones you keep alluding to. Um, and you can see this throughout history. Again, I watched this great movie. I recommend it to anybody listening. It's The Death of Stalin, which is kind of like a parody. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. awesome. But it's a great parody of the end of Stalinism when he dies. And the great thing is everybody in the movie, everybody in, in Soviet Russia at the time was terrified of him of going to the gulags or being killed or having their spouse taken away in the middle of the night and so they're constantly saying things that they don't agree with and so when you have a uh, bad identity leadership which is i would say stalinism is probably one of the worst forms of leadership in human history um you have a lot of what's called false consensus people say things they don't believe in at all um and wouldn't abide by if they were uh, alone and they didn't think you were spying on them uh if you have to spy on somebody as a leader you've already failed the, the great forms of leadership create what's called engaged followers. And so that means even when the leader's not there, people, the followers are so invested in it and buy into the vision that they're creatively making it happen even when you're not looking. So this can happen in countries uh, when you have people who just care about building community. It can happen in organizations where you're getting all kinds of innovation. When, you're not, when the boss is not aware, people still are coming up with interesting ideas. Um, and this can happen all in, in reform movements. You know, we talk, we've talked a bit about here with activism mm -hmm. is that it, activism it often works best when it's organic, when a lot of people are coming together creatively. One of the, you know, one of my favorite things about going to like a uh, protest is just seeing all the creative signs that people create and they come up with. Mm -hmm. And what that means is you have kind of the individualized voices of all the people, but they're part of a movement and they're creatively coming up with ways to, to make it better and, and build a sense of solidarity and purpose. And so that's fundamentally what great leaders do is they create that sense among their followers um, that I'm one of you, but we're all in this together and that I'm encouraging you to bring your yourself and your own ideas uh, to the movement and to the group. Yeah, that's the that's the good kind of leadership. And then we've also seen so many times um, in history and in present as well um, with that emphasis of virtuous mission, as you said, that, that highly moralizing ground that um, leaders can use in really creating and emphasizing the difference between inner and outer groups and the atrocities that it can lead to. So I always do emphasize the dangers and also uh, how to recognize these patterns and how leaders can really tap into these biological kind of characteristics of, of our brains as well. And what we can do is, yes, people do cooperate and co co coordinate with one another more when they see that they share identity, but then then we have to really work on these common bigger identities, right? And you also say these norms and the, these higher identities work as long as we believe in them. 
And with the fallout of democracies and thinking about what's the future of liberal democracies around the world, it becomes more, um, it becomes harder to, to think about what these shared identities can be. And I'm a Muslim, so I am very worried about not just what I see in the West uh, in terms of this ostracizing of Muslims and the idea that Muslims don't belong to in Europe or, you know, here and the history that is absolutely different or rather what we make of our histories. So, and that is Again, another thing that, you know, as Peter Singer said, and you write about it, expanding the moral circles, that's, again, both fascinating and frightening, because yes, we know how the rights of women, LGBTQ, et cetera, have been expanded and how uh, it, it worked throughout history. But then, again, when we say, well, we are the good ones and they are the bad ones, how easy it is to succumb to it for all of us. I don't want to make this a monologue. I want to kind of end it on a, on a positive note in terms of how you write in your book that people are also drawn together by common fate, right? Uh, when they recognize that they share the same set of circumstances. So it's just about what sort of alliances will there be formed, I believe, or what narratives are we going to believe in? You know, what is the future of European Union? Who belongs into European Union? Am I correct? How important are these narratives and the visions of the future in terms of the power of us that can be? Yeah, For I good. think one of, one of the key roles of, of leaders is creating a narrative. And mm -hmm. I think the, the narrative that bad, great leaders produce, historic leaders, is one of inclusion. Mm -hmm. So one of the examples we talk about in our book is Nelson Mandela, once he rose mm -hmm. to power uh, post apartheid in South Africa, um, the, there's enormous tension potential for a, a, a civil war or, or something of that nature. And one thing he did was he reappropriated uh, a symbol from white African, South Africans uh, in terms of their rugby team and used it and, and owned it and reappropriated it as a more inclusive symbol that included all South Africans. And it was like a kind of a symbolic gesture that he did to change the narrative of one that we're not we're going to go forward and try to create a inclusive liberal democracy from here on out. I think that's exactly what that symbolism was. And I, I think that the liberal democracy idea, and this is fundamental to it, is that it's about inclusion and it's about freedom. And that means accepting people from different backgrounds, nationalities, religious belief systems, that if you come in here and you play by the rules and uh, you have the freedom to do anything within you know, enormous amounts of latitude, that most societies throughout human history have not supported. Most societies throughout human history have been far more oppressive and, and far more dangerous. And so this is this is the kind of a, the best of all bad possible political systems, uh, which I think is what they say of democracy is, it's the best of, of the worst. Um, and so it allows you to capitalize on all those aspects of human nature, but it's only really there if you build those inclusive identities and norms. Mm -hmm. If you don't, it's a fragile thing. There's no reason to believe that you know, yeah. liberal democracies can't fall and they have fallen. And there's no reason to believe that the world will be run, you know, largely by liberal democracies if we don't uh, act, all of us, to ensure that it's there and preserve it and build institutions that protect it. Yeah. And on that note, to kind of um, wrap it up, because even if we don't solve the future of democracy, liberal democracies, I think these sort of books are also very important for individuals to understand, as you write also, what we could what we could be that we choose who we want to be actually uh, how we want to act and interact on a daily basis with people around us um, from the microcosmos or, or the smallest communities uh, by checking uh, you know putting a check on our internal biases recognizing them and all the way to all these umbrellas that we can and should create jay uh, thank you so much before we say goodbye i want to ask you something that i call five short questions, which are unrelated to your book, but because I try to make my guests approachable and allow uh, our listeners to hear them on a slightly more personal level. So here are five short questions. Uh, and the first one is, unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic is not over by any means around the world. But in your particular circumstances, is there anything that you would not want to forget from last year or from lockdowns or from this pandemic era? I mean, there's a lot that we want to learn from this um, in terms of mistakes we've made and to build a society that's more robust against this. Um, but in terms of like the, the thing that I've learned, 
is not to take your social relationships for granted. And that means your friends and family. It's so easy to take those things for granted. But I think one of the, the experiences of the last year and a half for me has helped me reveal how precious those are. And um, I'm, I'm not going to make that mistake again, I don't think, going forward. Mm -hmm. Which of your personality traits has been the most useful, Jay? Not the best tra trait, but the most useful. There's a, okay. there's a I'll, I'll tell you a story. When I was a kid, I grew up in Northern Canada, and I had this great co hockey coach as a kid, uh, Johnny okay. Cook. <laughs> and he, after one game, one season, he took us all one at a time into the hallway and gave us ratings on our leadership skills, our athletic skills, um, all of these dimensions to give us feedback and help us improve. And I remember thinking, he didn't give me very good ratings on like my leadership or my athletic ability. Um, but he said I was the best person on the team in responding to critical feedback. He says, you just Ooh. love to get critical feedback and get better. And I remember at the time, I must have been about like 15. I thought, that was dumb. Like, <laughs> I don't want that. Like, I wanted to be like the best athlete. Or yeah. best. And and now that I'm, I'm older, uh, much older, I think that actually is my best skill is just like going to everything with an opportunity to learn and grow and interact with different people and go to different places and try different things and, and get feedback and, and get better. And so I have to say that that, that that moment when I was 15 that I thought was pretty lame turned out to be, I think, maybe my Have best you ever day. seen him be afterwards? Yeah, he just retired last year oh, and yeah. I, a few months ago and I emailed him uh, to so wish him a happy retirement and, and told him I thanked, I thanked him for that. That's so that's really great. So when you have 30 minutes of free time, <laughs> which might be an abstract idea for somebody as busy as you are, but still here, what do you do when you have 30 minutes of free time? How do you pass it? Um, I tend to, if I'm not scrolling on social media, which I don't recommend, I don't think that's a good thing, but I waste a lot of time in my windows doing that. I'd say the thing that I do each day that is my best use of 30 minutes is exercise. Um, this happened when I had little kids because my first son, my son, my first kid, I didn't sleep very well. He didn't sleep in past 4 a.m. for about four mm -hmm. years. And I was decimated. And I found out the only way I could stay alert during the day would go be exercise in the morning, take him for a run in his little stroller. Mm -hmm. And now I have this great routine of exercising in the morning. And it makes me feel good. It often gets me outside. It wakes me up. And I'm more alert all day and more relaxed. And so I have to say, if there's one thing that I try to do every day, it's exercise for 30 minutes. And it's just like, it's so good for so, so many important. things. Yeah, so important. Okay, fourth question. What skill or craft would you like to get better at? That's a good one. Um, I, as you know, as I said, I, I'm always trying to get better at everything. <laughs> I think... <laughs> You're getting good critical feedback. Yeah, I'll say here's some feedback. Um, I, as you know, as of last week, I'm an author, which is a brand new identity, which I've never had before. And being an author comes with all these new responsibilities to like share your book and promote it and stuff. And it means learning entirely new skills that I've never had before in my life. Like we started a newsletter for people and it tried to make that engaging and fun and get it out there. Um, learning how to come on podcasts and like have conversations to communicate to a broad audience in a way that, that makes uh, the ideas useful to them so they can make you know, their group smarter and, and more inclusive. And so I think that's something I'm, I'm really trying to grow at now and get better at is talking to people outside my field in a way that gives them something useful that they can take away. So that's what the goal of the book was, but it's an evolving process for sure. Yeah. And then um, relatedly, are any of your friends completely opposite to you or are most of them similar to you? Um, so I have an interesting thing. As I said, I grew up in a small town surrounded by trees, no radio station, no bookstores in Northern Alberta. It was a hundred, you know, a hundred kilometers from any other town. And now I live in downtown Manhattan. And so I have this weird thing where everybody I grew up with and my family and friends are often so radically different in their lifestyle and beliefs and assumptions from mm -hmm. like living in lower Manhattan. So I've kind of, you know, I never planned to come to a place like this. Um, and I tend to have loved every place I've lived in, but it's one of those things where I end up scoring probably pretty high on measures of like the differences in socioeconomic background and rural versus urban and levels of education across all kinds of different people in my circles. I'm, I'm in, I'm in like definitely a bubble right now, but it's a very different bubble from the one I grew up in. And so I try to stay connected to my old uh, friends and my family and, mm -hmm. and do that in a way that keeps me grounded and just have a different perspective on things. Well, 
That said, thank you so much for, you know, getting uh, the time out of your busy schedule to uh, join and share these ideas that I, again, I think are so important. And the very title of the book, The Power of Us, Harnessing Our Shared Identities to Improve Performance, Increase Cooperation, and Promote Social Harmony, which you authored with Dominic J. Packer. I think it's such a great step for all those who want to invest time and effort, because ultimately it comes to time and effort to understand and then learn how uh, we can use the tools that scientists, social scientists provide for us as individuals and groups um, and apply them to be better citizens or friends, at least from my perspective. Thank you so much. Is there anything that you would like to share with listeners and viewers of Dignified Resilience? I, I always say this. I say, if you're going to read The Power of Us, I just encourage you to use it for good, not evil. Uh, <laughs> that's all I really care about. But, you know, um, thank you so much for having me. I, it, I think this is a wonderful podcast and initiative to give people the tools for, you know, yeah. resilience yeah. Uh, in a way that promotes social harmony is hard to do, but it's maybe the most worthy endeavor that we have as humans. Thank you so much again, Jay, and to all of our listeners and viewers. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you share this with your friends and enemies, if you'd like so. And uh, stay tuned for more conversations with people from all around the globe. Hold tight to those you love. Uh...